Hello, today is March 26, 2009, and we are in Natick, Massachusetts. This tape is part of the Morse Institute Library's Continuing Veterans Oral History Project. My name is Joan Craig, and our cameraman today is Dan McDermott of Natick Pegasus. Today, we are privileged to have with us David S. Ball. Welcome, David. How are you? Joan, thank you. Um, may I ask you when and where you were born? Uh, born uh, October 29, 1959, in Boston. And what is your current address? Uh, I live in, in Charleston, South Carolina. Where did you grow up? In Natick, all my life in Natick. I went to, uh, to Bennett Hemingway and Wilson Junior High and, and Natick High School. And what year did you graduate? Uh, 1977. 77. Mm -hmm. Being back here in Natick doing this interview, what do you see as the most significant changes in Natick versus when you were a young boy growing up here? Well, this is a wonderful town. And I grew up in Wethersfield. And what's different from, from South Natick or, or from Wethersfield is Russell Circle, the, the, the house that I grew up in, was on a hill and they simply flattened the top of the hill. There were no trees, they have these little ranch houses. Uh, and I just remember the town being very bare. And now you come downtown and it's vibrant, they have all these big beautiful buildings. And not so much the, the stores out on Route 9, but the, there's a flavor to the downtown, a very vibrant, very homey, um, significant kind of a feel, and it's nice. It's nice to be home. And what is your marital status? Uh, married to, uh, to Ann O'Donnell. We met in, in D.C. and we've been married now for uh, 14 years. Do you have children? Two daughters. Elizabeth is a sophomore at uh, Clemson University. She's 19. And Ashton's still in high school. She's uh, 17. Where and when did you enter the military? Uh, it was the 16th of January, 1991. Uh, I'd been trying to get into the service for 11 months, and the, the paperwork finally came, and I'm watching television, and Bernie Shaw is on TV, and he's in Baghdad, and he says, uh, I can hear the bombs dropping, and that's when I signed my name. So that's when I, I became a member of the service. Why? Why join? Yes. In my profession as a nurse, we seek out opportunities to make a difference. And being a member of the armed forces is one of those opportunities. So had you completed your nursing career prior to joining the service? Yes. And yes. where did you go to school for that? I went to the University of Florida and I graduated in 1989. And you have a degree in nursing or sciences? Well, it's a Bachelor of Science in Nursing. And back in 2002, uh, I went back and got a master's in informatics, which is the, the interaction between uh, computers and healthcare. So were you in the workforce at the time mm -hmm. as a nurse? Right. Where? Uh, well, in 89, I was in Florida. And uh, yeah, I guess I signed the papers in Florida. And what branch did you join at that time? Uh, the Air Force. Why did you try the Air Force? I think the Air Force is the most technologically advanced, the most, what well, we call it a force multiplier. If you if you have one unit, you have a soldier who's doing a job, he's pointing a gun, uh, you're able to do just so much. But if you had an airplane fly over and it could do reconnaissance that could tell you where to move all the soldiers, or if it could uh, shoot multiple rockets or drop multiple bombs, you are able to accomplish so much more. So somehow being able to accomplish so much more in the service, uh, that seemed like the right the right uh, branch for me. The other thing that I liked is you join a, a, a branch like the Navy, 
the Navy has tradition that goes back 200 years or 225 years of the Marines. And they get very comfortable with that uh, tradition. And the idea of being in something that is so new as the service that has the airplane or the service that's in charge of uh, cyber warfare or space warfare just sounded exciting. In joining the Air Force, were you joining to continue your nursing career also? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I, I had uh, friends that were flight nurses. They worked on helicopters at the University of Florida. And uh, so when I went to nursing school, it was, it was to do that. I'd been a firefighter EMT in college. And uh, when I had these friends that loved being flight nurses, I said, that's what I want to do. I want to be a flight nurse. So when I heard that the Air Force had flight nurses, uh, I decided that's what I wanted to be. So when you signed up, where were you sent? Did, did you go through a basic training like others? Right. Yeah. The, the, there's a military uh, indoctrination of medical services officer called MIMSO, and that was at uh, Shepherd Air Force Base, Wichita Falls, a miserable place. How long were you there for? It's just a couple of weeks. Um, they're trying to teach you how to wear the uniform, how to march in a straight line. Uh, and they, they aren't all that uh, picky about it because they've, they've got a bunch of doctors and nurses and they're, they're really interested in, in bringing your expertise into the service. But they want to teach you that uh, you're supposed to follow orders and this is where you look up regulations and that sort of thing. And when it was diff what was the weather like there? during, was that in January that you went, or? Uh, no, it, that would have been, I don't know, a couple months later. Okay. Um, it was miserable. I've blocked everything about Wichita Falls out of my brain. What, what do you think you disliked most about it? About Wichita Falls? Mm -hmm. um, there was nothing there. I, I, I don't recall. There are some wonderful places I've been with the service and uh, some places you just want to forget. And uh, the two that come to mind, one is Camp Bullis, which is in Texas. Where I, I went to a survival school there. And the other is Wichita Falls, so. <laughs> Did you receive advanced or specialized training beyond the basic training? Then? Right, right. Then I went to flight school, which was the best experience of my life. So even as a nurse, you still went to flight school? Oh, you need to, mm -hmm. because the, the difference between taking care of a patient at, at a bedside in a hospital and being able to take care of them at 30,000 feet are very different. So tell us a little about but that training. Where did you go for that, and what well, was it like? Well, you, you go to, uh, to Brooks uh, in Texas, and uh, so you're going to San Antonio. And what the, the significance of, of altitude physiology is that when a patient is in a bed in a hospital, they have, they react to their environment in certain ways. But if you were to take somebody up to altitude, some things are different. For example, the barometric pressure, the amount of, of oxygen in the air is, because there are less oxygen molecules, the air is thinner, um, there's less air for people to breathe when you're up at altitude, even though you're in a, a pressurized compartment. There's vibration there's noise, there are temperature variations. There are all kinds of stresses, not to mention the, the emotional stresses that, that people have. So in order to take into account all of those changes, and gases expand. For example, if you had an endotracheal tube, a tube going down your throat to help you breathe, or you had a Foley catheter so that you could urinate, those have balloons, and those balloons have to be inflated in order for the devices to stay in. Well, you can either put water or air in them. If you were to have an endotracheal tube that had air in it, which is what you'd find in the local hospital, and you went up to altitude, because there's less pressure at altitude, trapped gases expand, and you'd have a problem. You'd have damage to your trachea, or you'd have damage to your bladder. So one of the things you, you would know as a flight nurse is you'd say, ah, oh, trapped gases. So when somebody's just had surgery and they have trapped gases, when someone's just had a tooth filled, those are trapped gases. And until those gases dissipate, if you go from ground level to, to altitude, you can have a problem. 
and you need to know what to do about it. And you need to know that before you take somebody to altitude, you need to replace that balloon in the throat or in the bladder. You need to fill out with water. It sounds like a simple thing, and it is a simple thing as long as you, you know that. But those are some of the things that you learn with altitude physiology. So how long were you in flight school in Texas? It's six weeks. And did you make friends at that point? Did you have a core group that you were kind of working with that you got to know or? Well, you meet people from, from all over the country. Uh, you wouldn't necessarily go with somebody from your squadron. You might, uh, but you, it's just as likely that, that you wouldn't. It turned out that I sat next to a woman and I was a second lieutenant and she was a major, and she turned. She ended up being our squadron commander many years later. And I was sitting next to Sharon, and she asked the first question when we got there, and she raises her hand and she says, how long do I have to be a major before I can become a colonel? And I'm sitting there thinking, you know what, I'm getting paid, you know, I'm doing exactly the same job you are. You're being paid as a major, I'm being paid as a second lieutenant, and you're busy asking about that. Well, it turns out she's a fast burner, and she... What do you mean by a fast burner? Well, someone who um, works very hard and, and wants to get ahead and uh, has sucked the marrow out of her service to the country. She's done everything that she can do and given a lot to her nation, and, uh, and I applaud her for it. But that day, I was annoyed, and it's like, who the hell are you? Um, but it was funny that I just happened to be sitting next to somebody who years later would be my squadron commander. And you find over your career that you end up running into people who you'd gone to flight school with eight million years ago. So after your six weeks there, what happened then? What was your plan or what was the plan for the Air Force, with the Air Force for you? Well, once you win your wings, and there's an interesting little thing about that. The, the start of, of flight nursing was in 1943. Uh, before that, I mean, we've put wounded patients in airplanes since World War I. Uh, but you just kind of stick them in the airplane, they wouldn't get any care. The, the idea of flight nursing is that not only could you package the patients, but you could also care for them while you're flying. Because some of these flights, we, we can fly for 10, 12, 14, 16 hours. And you can imagine people either need pain medicine or uh, their heart stops or, you know, different things happen. Well, in the, in the history of flight nursing, one of the most interesting things that ever happened was during Vietnam. And they tried flying people out on the C-5, which was a, a very large airplane, and we still fly some of the C-5s. And they had something called Operation Baby Lift. And during that time, they had a flight crew, and, and in the C-5, it has two levels. It's this enormous, cavernous plane. And so they had a flight crew on the bottom level and one on the top level, and they were taking out orphans out of somewhere in Vietnam. And they're flying along, and one of the pressure doors on the plane blows out, and the plane crashes. And it turns out that virtually everybody who was on the bottom part was killed, and, every, and just virtually everybody that was on the top part lived. Well, the, the flight nurse, and a, a flight crew is, is generally five people. It's a medical crew director who's a nurse, a flight nurse, so you have these two officers, and then you have three enlisted people who are ambulance technicians, and uh, they're called air medical evacuation technicians, AETs. So of this five-person crew, the flight nurse on this Operation Baby Lift that crashed, uh, her name was um, uh, Regina Ani. She's a colonel. She's recently retired. And when they crashed, she, um, I think her back was broken, um, but the crew got all the babies off and all this kind of stuff, and she reported off, and after she saluted, I think that's when she went unconscious. It was that sort of thing, and, and she was awarded the, uh, the Air Force Silver Star 
I mean, one of the highest decorated people in, in, in Air Force history. And she came to speak to our class, our graduating class uh, of flight nurses. And when you receive your wings, often you'll have some family member there to pin it on. And I, and I didn't have anybody. So I went up to her and I asked her to pin on my wings. And so there's a, there's a direct connection between that earlier period in flight nursing and me. Mm -hmm. And, and I, I, that was neat. But so after I, I won my wings and, and we go back to the squadron, and that was kind of fun because I'd, I'd driven to Texas and on the way back, uh, the car broke and it was hard broke. I mean, some uh, piston went through the engine block or something and I had to abandon the car. And uh, I went up, I was in Louisiana and I went up to, to it was a, uh, uh, like a junkyard and I went in and I was talking to these people. They were speaking English. I was speaking English. I couldn't understand a word they were saying because they spoke Cajun. So they would have to write things on pieces of paper and I'd talk to them. But eventually I, I got back to South Carolina. And what you do after you, you've been to flight school is you go to ground school and then you do flight training and eventually you uh, get a check ride. So ground school is maybe a week and you're learning things like uh, where's the fire extinguisher? Where's the crash axe? How do you open the exits? Um, how do you change the lighting levels in the plane? That kind of stuff. How do you secure the litters to the floor or to the brackets? So you're doing the, the ground school for about a week, and then you do a series of flights. You have a flight instructor. You, you'll probably have five or six flights, some of where you're the flight nurse, some where you're the medical crew director. So the flight nurse is primarily doing the patient care. The medical crew director is on the headset talking to the front end and coordinating and making decisions and filling paperwork and things like that. So when you, you finished your, your, your flight portions, the last instructor will recommend you. You get recommended for a check ride. And what, what is a check ride? Check ride is an examiner whose job it is is not to teach you but to see whether or not you meet Air Force standards. And you, you go through a, a flight, uh, a, a training flight, and they evaluate whether or not you should be a flight nurse. And when you pass your check ride, you are current and qualified. And there are also some tests. You have to take a closed book test, an open book test, things like that. Did you find that exciting or tedious or? Exciting, all of it exciting. Yeah. And you really just wanted to get up there and help. Mm -hmm. So once you received your wings and you passed, mm -hmm. then what? Um, then you can go on flights uh, without an instructor. Until then, you're under somebody's wing. So if you were flying as a student and something happened, the instructor would uh, take the emergency bottle. They would be uh, responsible for the emergency. They make decisions. But when you're current and qualified, um, you sign up for missions, either for training missions or for live missions where you're going and taking care of patients, um, and you don't need any supervision. So when you sign up for missions, did you have a choice of what missions you wanted to mm -hmm. sign up for? Sure. So tell us about some of those. Oh, they're great. I mean, currently, we do a mission each month to St. Croix um, because from the front end perspective, the, the pilot group, that's a different squadron. The, the loadmaster, the pilot, the co-pilot, and the airplane are coming from a different squadron. We're a squadron of flight nurses and med techs. So the front end crew, uh, they have to have international navigation training. So they have to pick some place that's outside the United States. So St. Croix is a nice place. So they say, well, let's go to St. Croix. And so that's what we'll do. We'll, uh, We'll plan to go there. We'll take a bunch of flight nurses, students, and we'll take a bunch of extra people, and they'll be patients, and we'll moulage them up. We'll put on uh, fake injuries, and we'll give them assignments of how they behave in the emergency, and then we'll do training flights, and we'll do training on the way down and on the way back. So that's with all the training. What about going forward, I know um, prior to the interview, 
you talked about being in this amazing job for 18 years so yeah. and that you've seen what I would call some action so so talk about after these training sessions were you ready to give it your all and what came about for you to do that in terms of being deployed exactly um, I'd been in the reserves for several years before I got deployed. And it used to be that getting deployed was a rare honor. It was something that during the Cold War there weren't a lot of um, live missions that, that we could do. So if you had all of your, uh, we'll call them A-forms, they had um, uh, training requirements. I have six pages of things that all need to be up to date. Is your CPR card? Is your gas mask good? Uh, your egress training? All these things. So if your A forms are clean and um, you're friends with the commander or something, they would have. They they might only have two or three slots to go to Grenada or to go to uh, our first. The first thing we did as a squadron was we went to uh, Jonestown. Seventy-three. That was before I was with the squadron, but um, but if you had some sort of a disaster, you know, you might only be sending a couple of people. But nowadays, it's it's not as difficult to to get deployed. There's a lot more, a lot more things to do. But I was first deployed in um, 1999. I went to Kosovo. So prior to Kosovo, you were in the reserves. What were you doing in your non-Air Force life in your um, everyday life? My real life. Your real life, <laughs> right. Well, the real life is being a nurse. And, and at this point, where, were you in the Carolinas then, or were you stationed? I guess I, guess I was in Florida. Mm -hmm. um, I worked in intensive care uh, and in the emergency room. And that was full time? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, okay. the reserves is... Uh, it's a weekend thing, it's a two weeks a year training, and then it's deployments. And in 1999 or late 90s, did you realize because of what was happening throughout the world that you would be deployed? Was that a given or was it a surprise? Um, not a surprise because you, you see the kinds of things that were going on in the Balkans. Uh, one of the things that I don't think people appreciate is when you're in the reserves, often you have the opportunity to volunteer. It's not necessarily something's going up, you gotta go. And it, it's a great struggle because in addition to paying attention to my employer and paying attention to my family, I'm also paying attention to, my, to the Air Force. And so the Air Force says, we have some needs, we'd like you to volunteer. Well, if you go to your employer and you say, you know what, I'm volunteering to go away for four months. They're going to look at you and they're going to say, aren't, aren't, you, uh, aren't we our, your first priority? And, uh, and then you go to your family and they say the same thing. You don't love me? Why would you want to go away from me for four months? So there's this, this tension. And, and so what we end up doing is we go to the Air Force and we say, we want you to tell us that we have to go, even though we want to go. And so the Air Force says to us, Tell people that you've been tasked. And that's kind of what we say. Uh, my family couldn't understand why I would want to volunteer. When I, when I told my folks that I was volunteering to join the Air Force, their response was, and, and this, was, this was right when, when uh, Desert Storm was kicking off, my dad said, you're going to be crawling behind some platoon sergeant in a big sandbox. You know, as soon as you have your name on the line, they're going to suck you in and you're going to be off doing stuff. And I said, no, I'm not trained to do anything. They're not going to send me someplace with no skill. And they didn't. When I joined, I went to the squadron and they had, most of the people were gone. You know, they'd gone off to the war. So the people that were left running the sections didn't really know what they were doing and things took a little bit longer. That was frustrating. But so when Kosovo happened, uh, I, was, I was eager to, to put that stuff to use. You know, I'd been doing this for several years, 
And there were some live missions. We go to Germany, we pick up people that uh, need to come to the States. And so there are, there are live real missions that happen every month. This is before Kosovo. Yeah, and there have been. Kosovo. Yeah, ever since, um, well, ever since the 40s. We so had, when you were picking someone up from Germany, who might it have been? Well, you have somebody who's in a car wreck and they, uh, they're active duty and they really need to be by, seen by a specialist in Washington, D.C. Well, someone has to get them there. So in addition to having training flights, we have live missions. And so we'll have two or three live missions a month, two or three trainers a month. So there's plenty of work. Um, we have regular PACAF missions where we fly to Japan and pick up patients, or we'll fly to Hawaii and pick up patients. Um, so there are people all over the world that are DOD people and they need to be moved. They have medical needs. And what do you mean by DOD people? Uh, Department of Defense. Okay. So tell us what it was like when you were deployed to Kosovo. It was very interesting. Uh, you can either get deployed with a bunch of people. For example, if you were in a squadron, let's say you were in a, a civil engineering squadron, your squadron might get called up and a whole bunch, you have 100 people, they all deploy together, they know each other, they've known each other for years. You go someplace and you do something. You repair a runway, you build a school. In our line of work as flight nurses, we're often going as a single crew two nurses and three techs. Or you could go individually. So in this case, I was the only person that went. And I was the only person who was, we used to differentiate between tactical and strategic flight nursing, where people that flew on the C-130, which is a, a small propeller cargo aircraft, would be seen differently than people that flew on the 141 or the C-17, which are jet aircraft. And the difference is the C-130 can get into very small places. So people that were very forward, if you, for example, collected casualties at a, uh, at a MASH hospital, you would fly the C-130 to the MASH hospital, pick up the wounded soldiers, and fly them back to a big runway that was prepared and, and flying back to Germany. And the, the Strat guys, and that's what I was considered, 141 and C-17. Meaning strategic? Right. We would uh, often fly people uh, across the pond. We would fly uh, from Germany to, to Washington, D.C. So when I went to Kosovo, I went with a bunch of people that were C-130 people, and I was a C-141 guy. So uh, they looked at me as like, oh, you're the guy that that kind of sits there while, while they fly across the ocean and we're the, you know, the rough and tumble tactical guys that get in there. So they viewed me differently. And did that view change? Um, a little bit over time. I, I was there the summer of 99 and what was difficult for them was uh, because I was the senior ranking person for, for the flight group, I was in charge of, of three crews and they were all C-130 people, all from the same squadron, and I was the only strat guy. And they were like, well, we've been deployed before, you've never been deployed before, we're flying mostly C-130s, and we're qualified on it, and you're not, and you're in charge. And so they kind of didn't like that. But you were successful. Yeah. So, what, so many of us see that as a long time ago, Kosovo as compared to today. So when you flew in, what type of casualties were you seeing? Well, that in the summer of 99, uh, the bombing was over. So we were, there, there was a certain level of disease and injury that happens whenever you have a footprint. For example, we were at Camp Abel Sentry, which was an army base in Macedonia. That's where we were based. And the footprint there was somewhere between four and 5,000 soldiers. So when you have four or 5,000 soldiers there, you're going to have a certain level of disease. You're going to have people with diabetes. You're going to have people that have a heart attack. You're going to have car accidents. You're going to have silly, stupid accidents. 
For example, with thousands of young men, and most of these soldiers are 18 years old, they join, they've seen a lot of movies, then you give them an automatic weapon. You tell them, keep this loaded, carry it around with you always. And every time you go to the chow hall, you need to uh, take the bullets out of your gun. So uh, you go up to a clearing barrel, you put the barrel in there, and you go through a procedure to clear your weapon. Every once in a while, you hear this, this gunshot going off because somebody cleared it wrong. Or people will do stupid things. They'll be drunk, and they'll be playing with their guns. We had an instance when we were there where a guy killed himself, uh, shot himself in the head. And what was unusual about that, he was playing Russian roulette, is normally when you play Russian roulette, you play it with a revolver. And so you'll have six chambers, you put a bullet in one, you'll spin it, and you'll pass the gun around and put it to your head and pull the trigger. And chances are you won't, you'll be fine because you only have a one in six chance of pulling the trigger and <clears throat> having the bullet. What is incredibly stupid about this is we were doing this with Berettas, which are clip-fed... Uh, when you say we... It, the military. Right. When okay. I say we, I'm talking about the army. Right, okay. The, the, the service I didn't join. Uh, they used clips where when you put a bullet into the clip, that automatically feeds it into the weapon. So the way that they were able to play Russian roulette because they didn't have revolvers was they had a bag, they filled it full of clips, which are where the bullets go in, and you put it into the bottom of the gun. And all of the clips were empty, and all of the, only one clip had a bullet in it. So you would close your eyes, put your hand in there, pull out a clip, and put it into the weapon. <laughs> so <laughs> you're guaranteed if you pick up a, a, a clip that has a bullet in it that you're going to kill yourself. So there'd be stupid stuff like that. Um, tragic accidents. We had a guy that um, was riding in the top of, I can't remember if it was a Bradley or a tank, but it has an antenna, a whip antenna on the top for communications. And they're traveling downtown and the whip antenna touched a, a power line and he got electrocuted. So that kind of stuff happens. So even though you're not uh, conducting uh, offensive military operations. The fact is that you've got people working around jet aircraft and people make mistakes and hurt themselves and break their legs and people get killed. And So there's a fair, fair amount of that. Or, or a guy uh, was talking to his friend, he was talking, telling him how to clear his weapon. He had a, a machine gun and the guy was looking at him um, and he didn't mean to, but he ended up pulling the trigger and bullets, you know, went up through his chest. And so some of them are accidents, some of them are stupidity, um, but you get that kind of stuff and, and that's what we had to take care of. Do you feel that the difference um, with someone like you who had experience in hospitals prior to this, that, that your reaction or actions towards helping these individuals might be different than, say, someone who was straight out of nursing school and decided to go into the flight nurse program? You're talking about my, my physical skills or my emotional maturity? I would maturity say more your or? emotional maturity with regards to some of the things that you, you were going to be faced with. I think what was helpful, I, I'd done a lot of emergency room work. And when somebody comes into the emergency room, what they say to you is, you won't believe how dumb I was. I did the dumbest thing. And you hear that a thousand times, and at some point you say, yeah, I know, people are like that. So yeah, I think that helps to, to be an experienced clinician and then go into an environment where it's crazy or people do things that are stupid. Or, yeah. So in your time at Kosovo, were you in and out and back and forth, as you said, um, to the States, or were you bringing some of these injured to, for instance, Germany, then to the States, or 
What was your norm? some of each? Most most of it is flying to to Landstuhl, which is a big hospital at, at Ramstein. Um, in Germany, right? Mm -hmm. In, in uh, south, southern Germany, and and then from there we we take them to Walter Reed or uh, or Bethesda. During that period of time, did you experience any concerns about your own safety? Uh, some the uh, the way in which they land, and we saw this more in Afghanistan than in in Macedonia. But uh, when the front end is concerned that someone might be sh uh, shooting uh, shoulder-fired missiles, or the, or there might be uh, weapons coming up from the ground, uh, missiles, um, they'll do certain kinds of approaches either one that's very high and then they aim to the ground so they can get to the ground as quick as possible. And there's another one where they do a box formation where uh, they start flying and all of a sudden they take a, a, a left-hand turn and another left-hand turn. It's very disorienting to be in the back where there are no windows and you don't get, you don't get visual cues. You're, you're standing up working on a patient or you're sitting down trying to work on my paperwork or something and all of a sudden you know, you, you get this high G-bank turn, and then by the time you land, you want to throw up, and your eyes are like all over the place, and it takes you two or three minutes just to be able to stand up. Now, when you're standing and they take a turn like that, are you strapped in, or...? Generally not. One mm -hmm. of the things they teach you in flight school is don't do, do things with two hands. Always have one hand where you're holding on to something, and the other hand where you're doing stuff. And, and that's sometimes more difficult than you might think. Especially as a nurse or yeah. a doctor trying to... Um, well, for example, you might be trying to hold on to an arm and you're also trying to reinforce a dressing. Let's say there's bleeding coming from a post-surgical site. So you want to support the arm. Let's say you have a broken arm. Uh, you want to support it and then you also want to put the, dress, put the dressing on it and wrap the bandage around it. So, so you're kind of cradling it and wrapping it and trying to hold on and so yeah. Any kind of funny humorous things that you can remember happening in cases like that? Hmm. No. <laughs> <laughs> so how long were you back and forth going in and out of Kosovo? Uh, it was it was the summer of 99, a couple months. And then you would come home and take up your normal life yeah. working in a hospital well, it was one of the toughest things of my life uh, was my, my wife taking me to the airport for this first deployment. And first of all, it's hard for her to understand how anybody would volunteer to go. And when I got back, I was so jazzed, so pleased about having put that training to use having experienced all I'd experienced. And her first question when she saw me, she looked me straight in the eye and she said, do you have it out of your system? And I didn't have the heart to tell her, absolutely not. I mean, to give you an idea, when, when I got to Macedonia, two days after I get there, I find out that the president is coming. And then I find out the next day that they need a crew to fly the president out if he has a problem. And since it's on a C-17, they only have one strategic guy in theater that is qualified on the C-17, and it's me. So I'm the medical crew director for President Clinton. And so he comes. And the night before, I, I wasn't sure if we'd actually get a chance to shake hands, but I decided to write him a note. And I, I wrote in the note, that my mother had been a refugee from Nazi Germany. She, she lived, born in Vienna, and her dad, when the SS came to take him away, uh, hid on the balcony, and he climbed over the balconies holding on by his fingers. And half my family was killed in the Holocaust. So the idea that America would go someplace and do something for people where there wasn't a 
vital national American interest. We weren't going there for oil. We weren't going there because we needed this strategic spit of land or something like that. We would go in there because it was the right thing to do uh, was something that I felt very strongly about. I was very proud and I wrote him that. And it turned out, he was, was a great speaker and he, uh, he shook hands with everybody. I got my picture taken with him. And he actually came through three times. I, I didn't realize we'd have all that time to, to meet and talk, and I gave him the letter. Um, but then after I met the president, all kinds of people came through. One day someone comes up and says, uh, who wants to have lunch with Bob Dole? So I went and had lunch with Bob Dole. And one day we're, we're down dropping off some patients or something, and this, this contingent of uh, people from Congress show up and it's uh, Senator, Senator Carl Levitt and some representative, I can't remember the congressman's name, and they get off the plane, they're refueling the plane, and they go out outside the wire and they're starting to walk around. And I'm like, nobody's with them. So I had a gun, so I, I'm, I'm running up next to him and I said, uh, Senator, would you mind if I walked with you? And he said, oh yeah, Captain, come with us. And so he's asking me questions and, and I'm a Jew and Carl Levin is a Jew. And, and so we're there talking about um, this, this whole idea of being places where we don't have a national interest, where it's the interest of, of doing the right thing and helping people that can't help themselves. And so to, to have met um, Wesley Clark, to, met, to have met all kinds of two and three stars and senators and had lunch with people and had a chance to talk to the president and stuff, and this is in eight weeks, you know, on top of, you know, going and living in Macedonia and, and flying to Pristina and all these places. I mean, um, What was it like amazing. living in Macedonia? What was, what was the climate like and what were you living in? Were you in... Uh, well, we started out in tents. Mm -hmm. um, there's a tent city, every place where you, where you go someplace for the first time, they set up tents. So we were in tents. And, and they were pretty good because they prepared the ground first. Uh, they put down stones so it had good drainage. Um, and so the, the tents were fine. We were in them for a couple of weeks and then we got moved to a big dorm. And the dorm, unfortunately, didn't have air conditioning, um, which meant that they kept the windows open, which in and of itself is okay. But uh, they conducted helicopter operations just outside and we had probably without exaggeration, a hundred helicopters out there. These, the big Chinooks, the, the twin engines, um, lots of, of Blackhawks, and uh, these are operations 24 hours a day and they make lots of noise and they kick up lots of dust and stuff. So ordinarily not having air conditioning, uh, not a big thing, but you would have wished you could have had the, the windows closed. And in these dorms, we would often be uh, they were bunk beds, and they would be five or six high, and I was, I think, the fifth one up. So you'd have to crawl, and, and you'd kind of wake people up as you're climbing up on top of their bed to get up to the ceiling, you know, kind of the nosebleed section. And it, this was summer, so it was very warm. It was. It was. Now, there are mountains between Macedonia and, uh, and Kosovo. Um, so it, it was cool when you're flying. Uh, I got a chance... To, to fly in a Blackhawk and with the doors open. And um, so the, it did get kind of cool when you got up towards the mountains, but, but in the plains, uh, it, was, it was pretty warm. And so mountains were around you, but it was, was it a desert type of warm or? Um, yeah, kind of. <laughs> when you came back then, and your wife is hoping that you've gotten this out of your system yeah. and um, you knew that you hadn't. When were you called back up again? Or did well, again, I volunteered. Mm -hmm. uh, we had September 11th. Um, I was in graduate school and I saw that on, on the news and I drove to the base. Things were so confused that they didn't change the alert on the base. You know, normally, I was at the airport the other day, and, and the threat is orange or something like that. Well, on the base, they have threat cons for the base so that the gate guards know 
what to do, whether their, their weapons should be loaded, should they have uh, uh, barricades up, that sort of thing. And I drove there. The, the first tower had been hit. I don't think the second tower had yet. And, and they were still just kind of waving people through. They hadn't, they hadn't gotten into a bunker mentality. Um, but I got there, and they had Operation um, Noble Eagle, I think it was. And that, that is uh, defense of the United States. So we were put on alert. I'd never had a cell phone before. And they said, well, you can go home and collect stuff if you have a cell phone. So I ran out and got a cell phone. Um, but so we were on alert for a couple of weeks. So when they're saying collect stuff, this is to be ready? To go out to the door. To go out. Right. Um, and were you deployed right away or? No. 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 Um, now, when you mentioned you went to the base, what base was that? This is the Charleston Air Force Base. And at this point, that's where you're living, right? Right. Um, you had mentioned in an earlier point that you had a gun. Tell us why you had a gun. Well, as a medical person or as a uh, member of the clergy, you have the, the right to defend yourself and you also have the right to defend those that you're with. Um, I'm, no, I'm a non-combatant, but I'm an expert marksman. Uh, I, I'm, I'm trained to use the, the 9 millimeter, uh, which is a handgun, and I've also trained on the M16. Um, never had to use it, but, uh, but it's useful to have. So tell us after 9-11 what went on with you. Well, we were just all, all waiting to see what the president wanted to do. And one of the things that I appreciated was that President Bush did not lash out in the days following the attack on the Pentagon in, in New York City. Um, I felt that the administration was trying to figure out what happened and what the right thing to do was. And then the decision was to, uh, to go to Afghanistan. And I ended up going to Afghanistan. And how soon after 9-11 did you go? This was, uh, I think, December 02. And what was that like for your family? At this point, your daughters are how old? Well, let's see. The older is, is 19 now, and that was, what, six years, six ago. years ago? So they were not quite teenagers. Um, difficult. Does your wife work? No. Oh, I'm sorry, she does, yeah. Did she work at that time? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, was it upsetting for her also to have you go over again? It is. It is. She's, she's gotten a lot better, mm -hmm. um, and she's always been supportive, but uh, she hasn't liked it. Um, when you're away like that, do you have the technology and the ability to be conversing with her more on a daily basis, whether it be by email or cell phone? It depends. Um, when I was for, for Enduring Freedom, which is Afghanistan, uh, we were based in Oman, uh, just at the mouth of the Arabian Sea, and they had a uh, a little trailer that had internet access. So if you, were, if you were at the base every day, you could go there and you could get on the internet and email. Uh, and they also had telephones. Um, but for us as flight nurses, we were often flying someplace. So either because of the time zone or because we were doing a mission, uh, I would generally talk to her every couple of days. Do you, does any particular missions strike out or a, a, a remembrance of a difficulty or, or anything like that with these um, young soldiers, as you said, some, you know, get a gun in their hand and they go a little crazy, but did you find um, the war effort was causing increasing casualties that perhaps we back home really weren't hearing about what you might be seeing? Yeah, 
You know, for every person that's killed, and we've had 4,500 killed, there are 10 times that many who are, uh, have major life disruption forever. And by that I mean they've lost their legs or, um, or their, their minds are, are totally disturbed. And so when I was there for uh, the Afghanistan campaign, Launch Duel had received their 25,000th inpatient from, from the war. 25,000 people had gone through that hospital in, you know, in two or three years. And that's the hospital in Germany that you mentioned. Right, right. And, and you won't send somebody, you won't air evac them, unless it's something where you don't expect that they're going to recover um, readily. So if you had a, a small wound that you could just kind of suture up and they'd be back to work in a few days, you wouldn't air evac somebody. But if you if their legs were broken or something where you anticipated that they wouldn't be useful in a war zone and they would require a lot of rehab, then you would send them out. And so for every one that's killed, there are 10 times that many that are, um, that are wounded for life. Did any one in particular stand out in your mind? Yeah. Want yeah. to talk about it? Yeah. Um, it's hard. This was a 20-year-old guy who was um, uh, looked Japanese. He had a, an occidental um, look to him. And he'd been exposed to uh, an IED, an improvised explosive device. And we were taking him from Launch Duel to Walter Reed. And his parents had come uh, to collect him. And he, I think he'd lost his legs and stuff, and, and he didn't even know where he was. And he was calling for his mom. And, um, and his mom was holding his hand. Did he, so he didn't even know she was there? Yeah. He was in such shock? He was, he was just so screwed up. Um, and when I, when I think about the bravado that we in this country have sometimes about how we want to resolve conflict, I think about him and, uh, and I hope it's worth it. I hope the things that we do are um, are worth the, the price that we pay. Especially when you see that they are so young. It turns out that statistically more than 50 percent of, of these major, major cap casualties um, are teenagers. They are under the age of 20. And, um, and they, they didn't start out having the judgment or the maturity associated with being able to internalize what it is that we're doing. And then they are scarred for life, um, either from these explosions where they have orthopedic injuries or we brought back lots of people with burns. And it used to be if you had a 20 or 30 percent burn, you would die. We've gotten to the point at, at Brooks in Texas where they can take people who have 90% burns, and they may require 50 surgeries. They may be living at the hospital for a decade, but they'll live. And, and the same thing with, with a lot of our technology, react, reactive armor, with the, uh, the flak vests that they wear, things that would have killed you in a heartbeat. Now what they do is they wound you for life. And so it used to be that people would either be fine or they'd be dead. And now lots of them are neither fine nor dead. So you did um, operations in Kosovo, Enduring Freedom, 
and I understand you also were in Iraqi freedom. Right. And when was that? That was uh, 2005 to 2006. And that was for a year. That, that one I was actually mobilized. The president sends you an order that says the president directs you. Uh, it wasn't a volunteer thing. And, and for me, that was an important distinction because I, um, I have real questions about uh, whether we should have been in Iraq. Was that difficult for you, that you, you were kind of torn, whereas before it was more, in, from what I'm hearing from you, more of a volunteer type of thing, whereas now it's, it, it's, it's being mobilized and it's a situation where you yourself are having conflict? No, no. I can be angry about what we're doing, but be clear about my role as a flight nurse. Um, when, when soldiers are in harm's way and you need somebody to go and get them and give them pain medicine or take them home, um, that doesn't change whether the, whether the war is a just war or not. You still have wounded soldiers. You still have an opportunity to make a difference. And so I appreciated that opportunity. I was proud to do that job um, without agreeing with the politics. I felt a lot more com comfortable with the politics in Kosovo than I did with the politics in Iraq. And knowing that there was such instability over there, um, was there even greater concern from your family and friends that you were going back over in a situation that was um, so severe that from day to day they didn't know what was going to be happening and, and, and feared for your safety? Yeah, yeah. And I, I, and I try to explain to them that um, I don't know that we've ever had a flight nurse killed in combat. Um, you know, in Operation Baby Lift, people, a uh, number of people got killed. But um, generally, we're not someplace where there's a firefight. There are medics that are associated with Army and Marine units that um, do heroic stuff every day, and they get shot at and they get killed. Uh, but we're generally stationed at uh, forward airfields. So uh, we may hear artillery in the distance. Um, we may fly someplace where we end up getting shelled. And has that happened? It did. It happened to me uh, only once. I've been in for 18 years. Um, and it was, it was difficult because we had this discussion on the airplane. Um, we were based in Germany, and we're flying into Balad, which is about 30 kilometers northwest of Baghdad, main base for, for the Air Force. And they got shelled every day. As a matter of fact, if you, if you lived at Balad, when you were done, they had this computer program that would give you a photograph that would show where all of the missile strikes had been during the time that you were there. So it, it would say something like, I survived Balad, and it would show you know, 300 missile strikes on your base. Uh, so it was common to, to be shelled at Balad. Our concern was, we take the C-17, which is a $200 million airplane. You get five for a billion bucks. You take it in there, and um, it's a big target. If that gets hit, and if we have patients on board, what do we do? If the shelling starts, do we take off um, before you've loaded all the patients? Do you take off before you load any of the patients? You know, what do you do? So we landed, and we try to land at night and try to come from a different direction each time so that uh, uh, it makes it less likely that we'll be shot at. And uh, the plane was on the ground, and um, and we just started loading the patients. So the ones that were in the plane, plane, we left somebody, one of our team on the plane, and the rest of us ran for bunkers. Um, and one of the things that's difficult is not so much about your personal safety, because you can, you can establish where the safest place to be. And probably being on the airplane with all that gas is probably not a good place. You know, being in the bunker is good. Um, but because I, I have an obligation to the patients and some of them can't walk, you know, what do you do? Do you hang out on the airplane? Um, do you 
make it more likely that you're going to get hurt by shepherding a lot of people who either have bad eyesight or can't walk well or something like that. Uh, and we were trying to decide, because it really isn't a hard and fast rule, what do you do if the aircraft gets shelled when you're there to unload patients? And, and our, our answer was, was just get as many people to the bunker as quick as we can. Anybody who was on the airplane, we're going to stay on the airplane. And that's what we did. Is there a chance that you're going to be called over again? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. The president has uh, said that we're going to increase our footprint in Afghanistan by at least 17,000 troops. And, um, and some of them are going to have heart attacks. Some of them are going to be in car accidents. Some of them are going to get shot, either because they've, uh, they're fooling around with a gun or because the enemy's out to get them. So, yeah. Do you feel you were an officer, so you were a leader. Do you feel that you and other officers above you were good leaders or are good, are good leaders? That's a very general question. Um, if by that, when I'm a medical crew director, when I'm in charge of my team, we're leading a medical mission, uh, do I think that we're competent and show good uh, officership and leadership? Uh, yes, I do. Um, when it's at a more senior level, when we're interacting either with other services or with other nations or uh, our international politics, I, I don't know. I can, I can only speak from the, from the mission level, at the tactical level, uh, almost without exception, the officers that I've dealt with have been uh, competent and caring and good officers. So you're, you're, you're visiting Natick right now. You're going back to the Carolinas. You're going back to your real job. That's right. And you and your family are anticipating you're being called back, most likely to Afghanistan. Right. And how are you feeling about that? Um, conflicted. The, the role that I play there uh, is one that I find very exciting and very rewarding. Some of the mo more rewarding aspects of my life have been associated with uh, the military and, and giving patient care. On the other hand, at the end of all wars, and they all end, you hope that what you've accomplished is something that's of value. And at the end of World War II, what did we have? And the answer is we had 50 years of peace. And we got a democratic and a Japanese uh, partner in the world. And so, when we look back at that and we say, well, we got 50 years of peace and we got uh, a change in the administration of these countries and Germany, which had um, instigated the First World War and then the Second World War, so we got a lot of good things. And we look at the Second World War and we say, that was a good war. Um, do we feel the same way about Korea? Do we feel the same way about Vietnam? I'm, I'm not sure what did we get for Vietnam. We got 53,000 people dead. I'm not sure how many were wounded, but it was a lot. And so I'm, I'm very enthusiastic about our president. I think President Obama is a very smart, very caring guy. And I think going to Afghanistan as a military is probably an important thing because America has enemies in the world. And those that we can separate, if, if we can make a distinction between people who are very sympathetic to our enemies and we peel them away and we get a small core of people that are our enemies and will never be anything other than our enemies, we need to find them and kill them. And a lot of those enemies train in Afghanistan and the mountains of Pakistan. And 
I think that we as a nation, in order to be safe and in order to keep our friends safe, uh, need to go there as a military to kill them. So as long as we need to do that, I feel that being a flight nurse in the Air Force is a, a useful and valuable thing. And the fact that the president is in Afghanistan with the military, I think, is a necessary evil. But at some point, that's going to stop. And I hope that we've won something at the end of that. I hope we, we get something for what we pay for. What is your current rank? I'm a major. And while you're still in the reserve, have you joined any other organizations that are veteran affiliated, such as American mm -hmm. Legion, Veteran of Foreign Wars, any of, any of those? No, no. I'm a member of, um, of AMSIS, which is a uh, military medical organization. They do a lot of uh, research. And I'm a member of uh, the Reserve Officer Association, which does lobbying efforts at Congress for military issues. Have you received veterans' benefits, such as hospitalization? Have you utilized the GI Bill or anything like that? I was thinking about going back to school and using the GI Bill, but uh, no, I've not used any benefits. How important to you is serving in the military? It's, it's been one of the more rewarding things I've, I've ever done. How do you feel it's affected your life? A sociologist once tried to put all the things in your life in perspective. His name was Maslow. And he said that there's certain stuff that you have to do for safety or um, you know, having a, a roof over your head or, or food or something like that. And he said that it's kind of a pyramid. And at some point, you get to a point where you've satisfied all your base needs for, for food or sex or, or something. And at some point, you want to be um, appreciated by your peers or you want to, um, uh, you have these higher order needs. And he said the highest one was something called self-actualization, where you become what it is that you want to be. And I experienced that for a moment. I was doing annual tour, which was that two weeks a year thing. I was flying rescue in Panama. And we were on a C-130, and we'd flown to a city called David in Panama on the border with, I can't remember what the name of the country was. And I'm standing on the back ramp of the C-130, and it's a dirt strip. There are no lights. We're starting to lose the light. The pilot is, is yelling, we got to go. And we just picked up a, a boy who uh, was having acute appendicitis, and I was there starting his IV on the back of the plane. And there I was, thinking that I was doing what I wanted to do, you know, that I was, I was making a difference, I was in some far off place. If I wasn't there, sure, somebody else could have done that job, but it was, it was an important, skill-based something, and I was there doing it, I was being it. Or in Iraq, we, we showed up one day in Pakistan to pick up a colonel um, who was in horrific pain. We have a pain scale, zero to 10. His was a 10, and it had been that way for two days. Well, I get off the back of the plane, and you look around, there isn't civilization for 100 miles in any direction. But we show up, and we make that difference. You know, you give them that pain medicine, or you, you, know, you fix them, or you do CPR, or whatever. And you feel, you feel self-actualized, and, and that's what the Air Force has done for me. Looking back, I know you mentioned the young um, Asian-looking 20-year-old with his mom. Are there any other memorable experiences or characters or happenings that you'd like to share with us as we wrap this up? 
well, two. Two. One is, is a, a young boy who, we, we're just finishing up a training mission here at Charleston, <clears throat> and we haven't shut down the plane yet, and we get a call, and they say, we have this emergency mission we want you to fly. So we get everybody off the plane, and I'm, I'm left with a crew, so it's, it's the five of us. And what they want us to do is go pick up a child who has a bad heart, and he needs to move to a different state. Uh, he needs a heart transplant. But what's interesting about this child is he's on something called ECMO, which is, uh, think of it as an artificial lung. You have all this equipment. If, if you were to go in for heart surgery, they would put you on a bypass machine, you know, like a dialysis machine, kind of sure. cleans your blood. Well, this is kind of an artificial lung, artificial heart thing. And ECMO weighs several tons, and it's a very advanced sort of thing. Well, the problem with this child was he couldn't get on the list to get a new heart in this other state because you have to be in that state to be on the list. He couldn't get to that state because he was on ECMO. He couldn't be taken off ECMO because he would die. So until there was an Air Force, there was, even though they had ECMO, there was no way that this kid could live. But we were only the second time in history that ECMO had been done on an airplane. And we had the C-17, we flew to Texas, we picked up a 17-man team. There are tons of equipment. We went and flew and got the kid, took him to the other state, and you have to coordinate getting the ambulances, showing up on time, and all this kind of stuff. A 25-hour mission, all this different coordination to do something that, first of all, the kid's not in the military, right? This is a humanitarian sort of thing, but it's, it's displaying the best of America. You know, not only that we can invent ECMO and that we can do this heart transplant, but that we care enough that we're going to spend a million dollars to do this and that we're going to make this happen and that, that I was a piece of that and that was great. And the other story I want to share with you isn't really a flight story at all. But we were in Macedonia and we were 50 people, 50 Air Force people on an army base, Camp Abel Sentry. And the army they operate different than the Air Force. And I like to think that the Air Force has more resources or something, and that's why we treat people different, but they had a problem. The problem was people were racing around on the base with their Humvees, and uh, somebody got hit. A pedestrian got hit. So there are a number of ways of addressing that. And what the Army decided was that in order for people not to get hit by vehicles, they would have a road guard. They would have someone walk in front of every moving vehicle. That's the Army answer. And so we said, well, we're exempt from that, right? We're the Air Force. No, 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 everybody. So I have a picture of me in the ambulance. And you're looking through the windscreen of our Humvee ambulance. And you see our first sergeant and he's got his flak vest and his helmet, he's carrying his M16. He's walking in front of our ambulance. We had to get special permission not to have somebody walking in front of the ambulance when we were running red lights and siren. But that's the way the Army was, and, and that was the kind of interaction we had as Air Force people on that base. So sometimes just being in those different cultures, being in the Army culture, the Marine culture, um, can be kind of funny. Or difficult. Or difficult. As we wrap up, is there anything else you'd like to add, any comment you'd like to make as we complete this amazing interview? Amazing. It is. It's very interesting. As you mentioned, when we were setting this interview up, you do bring a totally different perspective on what has happened. So anything you'd like to finish up with? Um, America is the greatest nation in the world for a lot of reasons. And it may be the greatest nation that ever was. And part of our greatness has to do with the way in which we interact or 
influence other countries. And sometimes we have to do that with a coercive power. Sometimes we have to use our military. We will always have a military. There will always be wars. What I would like Americans to think of when they think of the military as a having muscle should be a last resort to do things that are important. And some things, like keeping the price of gas low, to me is not as important as some other things. Like, for example, if you had killing in Darfur, or if you had genocide in Rwanda, that's the kind of thing. Or in the Balkans, in Kosovo. That's the kind of thing, that moral imperative, that I'd like to see the military focus on. And I'd like American people, I'd like the families of service people, I'd like citizens that pay the bills for the military, that support the, support the war effort, to every single day wake up and recognize the sacrifice, the effort, that those in uniform make in their personal safety, in their discomfort, in their uh, not getting a chance to go and do the things that they'd want to do. So recognize the, the contribution that the, that the military does, but also I want them to every day wake up and ask us ourselves, okay, we've paid all this money, we've paid all this treasure, today should we be there? Is this worth it? Are we doing the right thing? Because every day, is an opportunity for us to stop that war. And I remember growing up watching Vietnam on TV. And when it was over, I thought about it and I thought, well, the last guy that got killed, what did we get out of that? I can understand why maybe we got into the war, but every single day we need to think not so much how much have we paid or how embarrassed we'd be if we left and didn't win or something like that. You know, at the end of the day, the family member doesn't care whether or not we won or not, okay? But there are important reasons why we go. And every day we should think about whether or not we should be there today. And are there important reasons when we should leave? Or should we leave? Yeah. Things like that. Well, David S. Ball, I want to thank you not only for making the trip up to Natick, but also for sharing your 18 years of experience with us today. Thank you for coming in. You're welcome.